Well, I'll call the meeting of the Deerfield School Committee meeting of Tuesday, November 9th, 2021 to order at 5.30 p.m. I do want to note that this is a virtual meeting and it is being recorded. So, um, so we will begin the meeting by uh, reviewing the minutes of September 14th, 2021. If anyone would care to make a motion. <clears throat> motion to approve the minutes of September 14th. And do we have a second? Second. And carry a second. Any discussion or any notations? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing none. All those, we'll do a roll call vote. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. <clears throat> David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? You're muted, Erica, so if you're out there. Well, We'll call it. I, I'm here and I, I say yes. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, nothing. Uh, so it's unanimous. Uh, the next item of business would be our financial statement and uh, warrant summary, which I assume would be Shelly. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good evening, Shelly. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, so since last meeting, you all signed 21 warrants electronically. Those were for the months of September and October. In the October meeting, since it was joint, we did not review the September warrants, so I've included those in here. Mm -hmm. uh, the total of the 21 warrants was $223,521.47. Uh, I did send out the general fund and school choice expense reports through October 31st, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Um, there's two financial things to make you aware of at this time. <clears throat> One is um, we are going to see an increase in administrative costs. Um, we have some unbudgeted contract services that are associated with curriculum that are going to cause a potential overage in our contract services line. I'm currently looking at some grants to see if there's any opportunity to pay that contract service out of grant instead of having to hit the budget. Um, it is estimated right now that the expense will be between seven and ten thousand for Deerfield's portion because it is an expense that's shared over all four elementary schools. Um, but I'll keep you up to date on that. I hope um, with the next meeting, I'll be able to just let you know that we found another funding source and it's not going to hit general fund. If it is going to hit general fund, I do think we're going to have savings and other lines that can cover it. So I'm not concerned about there being an issue <clears throat> with the budget at this time, but I just wanted to bring that matter to your attention. Um, and then the other piece is uh, something that might involve more of a conversation. Um, we have not talked about any um, upgrades to the kitchen for the school lunch program to date. Um, and typically this kind of thing would normally come up during a capital discussion. And I think Darius is going to talk about some of the larger items during a capital discussion. But what I wanted to bring your attention is that the new food service director who started last December, um, Jeff McDonald, he replaced Mary. And him and I have spent a lot of time over the last several months talking about increasing food quality and increasing um, safety standards and increasing uh, efficiency and productivity in the kitchen so that food can be better prepared for our students in a more timely fashion. Um, and in order to do that, it would require us purchasing some equipment outside of our capital requests that we typically submit to the town. Um, we're talking about things to give you a couple of examples. Um, my understanding is that there are four double ovens in the kitchen uh, and only one of them works. And it's not even really up to 100% working capacity. The thermostat um, regularly has to be looked at to make sure that the food's being heated properly. Um, the other ovens, some work sometimes and some don't work others. And it's things that over the years that Jeff believes that uh, the previous food service directors repaired and we did have people coming in um, to take a look at them when ovens went down. But we're just sort of at a point now where we need to be looking at purchasing equipment instead of continuing to repair. 
um, you know, you replace a thermostat, it's still not going to be 100% effective in a piece of equipment that's, you know, 10 plus years old and really at its life expectancy. Um, so there's some smaller things that we're looking at with him, but the conversation with you all uh, is really about asking to allocate some funds from existing resources, potentially as soon as the next couple of months in order to try to make some changes for this fiscal year. Um, we do have uh, funds in the revolving account for school lunch. Um, if you remember last year, we moved some wages around so that the school lunch fund could save up some money. Same situation as what we have planned this year. We're using some grants to pay for wages. So right now we probably have about a $65,000 balance in that account. We could allocate some of those funds to purchase some equipment um, and these are smaller items that will add up to, you know, a little bit of a larger amount. You know, we're not talking about a $40,000 piece of equipment. We're talking about, you know, the oven quote came in at $8,900, which is still technically a capital expense. But we're almost at a point from what I'm hearing from Jeff um, is that we can't wait much longer to do some of these smaller things. Um, so one option, like I said, would be using the school lunch revolving funds, and then another option would be to look at school choice or a combination of both. Um, and then also, uh, I believe the dishwasher is on the capital list that Darius will talk about later, um, which would be a request from the town because that is a much more costly piece of equipment. Um, but my recommendation, not necessarily for you to prove tonight unless you're ready to make that um, call would be that we start thinking about putting 25000 into the kitchen this year um, from the various funds that I mentioned previously. Before I continue, is there any questions at this point? I know that that was something brand new that we have not talked about in the past, um, really just came up as something urgent to me in the last month that we needed to get on the radar. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I just have a Quick question or quick request, Shelly. There's a capital planning committee meeting tomorrow night. <clears throat> if there was a general list that, of the items or, you know, just a general ballpark number, which you just gave us. Um, if uh, Darius, I think you're going to be in on that too. Were you, did you say yeah. earlier today? I'm going to be there and I will be sharing with you our general list when we talk about the capital right. thing. So mm -hmm. you guys I just said, I would just run it up the flagpole with that group tomorrow night so that we can let them know that we're probably going to proceed before um, all capital requests are reviewed. So, but that's fine. Thank you. Great. Anyone else have a question? Uh, Shelly, I have a question. Before, not with those capital request items. Is this a good time for that? <laughs> Can you say that again, Carrie? I couldn't hear you. I have a request about the report itself, not, okay. not the kitchen issues, if that, okay. Um, I'm so sorry to bring this up now, not early when I got the email, but I think the reports you emailed today, they're dated through 8 31, 2021, and they seem to match the ones reviewed at the September meeting. Oh. It's possible you would have strong ones. It is definitely possible that I grabbed and dragged the wrong ones in. I'll take a look at that and send them out to you all again. Okay, thank sorry you. About that. <laughs> Mary, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Can you tell us a little more about the overage the curriculum that was for curriculum uh we currently have someone on a leave of absence and so we're having to backfill that position oh okay um, but we're still paying that wage because there's sick time involved great mm -hmm. okay thank you okay. thank you um, okay Any, what's next shall we? um the only other thing was i wanted to give you an update on the special education revolving fund uh which i won't speak to you know anything educational related but just money wise um we did have a student come into the program that we didn't anticipate um, and there is tuition involved in that coming into the district that's estimated to be around thirty-five thousand tuition coming in for this year um, and we don't have any expenses coming out of that account at this point. Nothing changed as far as um, staffing or needs as of this point with that student coming in. So that'll just help us build up that special education revolving fund for future use or unforeseen expenses. Um, so we're projecting about an $80,000 balance at the end of the year, including that tuition that we didn't have previously. So that was a change since the last update on the revolving fund. So I just wanted to give you that info. Good. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you.
Any other questions for Shelly? Um, seeing none, we will move on. The next item on the agenda is the principal's report. I know this is slightly out of sequence, normal sequence, but we wanted to uh, give Tina a chance to give a little bit of a lead into uh, discussion items later in the presentation, or maybe it's all at once, the school improvement plan <laughs> presentation too. So go ahead, Tina. Okay, so um, do you want to do the school improvement plan first? I did share that with you guys ahead of time. Um, I don't do the school improvement plan before public comment. Because you right. Want to put public comment. So yeah. So I, no, I just, just do a regular report. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks for the uh, clarification. So we've um, been fortunate enough to have a quite a few professional development sessions. Um, we participated with um, Bright, which is Bridge Resilient Youth in Transition on topics of trauma-informed practices and support strategies for use in the classroom. And we also had a nationally renowned author uh, of Cultivating Genius, Goldie Muhammad, provided a workshop for district teachers focused on research and book describing the equity framework for culturally and historically responsive literacy. This work provides a template for instructional planning. DES educators will receive her book soon and we're looking forward to learning more. Uh, general information that's happening is our family teacher conferences are underway, offering time for teachers and families to strengthen our partnership and to increase student learning and ensure a positive school experience for our students. Also a shout out to the Deerfield Fire Department for another successful and informative uh, grade three prevention, uh, fire prevention training for our students. They love to see the fire department. Um, and I just want to extend some congratulations and appreciation to our health staff who've worked um, to test over 300 uh, DES school members. They've developed a well-organized, smooth process, and um, we swab over um, all of our community in a little less than an hour, which is nothing to sneeze at. And then we have a VAX bus, but Darius, I know that's on your um Report so I'll let Darius uh, share that. We have a back bus coming in, and then school improvement plan we'll touch on after. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tina. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. I'm just Go ahead. Curious, and um, I'm just curious on parent-teacher conferences. Are those in person, or are they remote, or do people get a choice, or how's that flowing? Um, most of them are in person, but people get a choice. So um, convenience with Google Meets is helpful for some of those families that can't make it. Yeah, great. Thanks. Great question, David. Thank you. I didn't think of it. <laughs> um, okay, so we are at public comment, and I'm aware of three uh, people that have expressed a desire to speak this evening. The first of those would be if Sean is out there, Sean Durrett. <clears throat> Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, I wrote a letter that I wanted to read to the um, Union 38 administration and um, the school committee members, both for DES and also Frontier Regional. So I'm writing as a community member and Union 38 parent to express my appreciation for several reasons. First, I'm grateful to the district for hiring the anti-racism and equity consultants, Romney Associates, to help support and guide the work in our schools. I appreciate that Superintendent Modesto put out an open call earlier this fall for interested individuals to join the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee, and this gave me the chance to join the Subcommittee on Curriculum and Professional Development. So far, it has been a great experience to engage with so many um, committed community members working together to make our schools more just and equitable for all students. I also appreciate the chance to participate in the upcoming community dialogue series being sponsored by Frontier Regional and facilitated by the Collaborative for Educational Services. Four sessions will be offered on the topic of culturally responsive education, and I encourage members of the community to sign up through the Tilton Library website if they're interested in learning more. I'm a teacher and a school administrator working in a Greenfield school that has incorporated culturally responsive practices into the classroom. I'm grateful to Union 38 district teachers for learning more about how to incorporate best practices for supporting all students in, in their classrooms. For those not familiar with what this is, culturally responsive education is not a curriculum. 
It's an approach to teaching and learning. CRE looks for ways to make curriculum and learning more responsive and relevant to who is in the classroom and encourages teachers to recognize and draw upon students' cultural identities, language and communication skills, and background knowledge. In this method, teachers are also encouraged to utilize a diverse range of classroom materials as they develop a regular, rigorous curriculum for all learners in the classroom. All students benefit from being in a culturally responsive classroom in school because each student is treated as a unique individual. Many people will be familiar with this type of approach when it comes to learning differences. For example, some students need extra time or one-on-one -on -one support or reading interventions, but not all students do. So students who need learning support get what they need, and this is a common practice in all schools. CRE widens the scope of how we see students as individuals with different needs, not based solely on learning differences, but also on background, identity, language, heritage, and much more. Lastly, I wanna thank the district for offering the upcoming COVID vaccination clinics and making the vaccine easily accessible to students in our district. In my mind, all the topics I mentioned in this letter regard the safety and well-being of children in the district, and I'm heartened by the efforts and energy of so many to move our community forward in ways that benefit all our students. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> um, the next person that would be speaking that I had the, on the list would be um, Annie Curtis. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep my camera off because it's a little wild in my house <laughs> right now. Um, so you might hear some background noise, but I also wrote a letter um, that echoes some of the sentiments that Sean said, um, and it's addressed to school committees, but also administration teachers and staff. These are words of gratitude for the many things that you all have done to look out for the safety and well-being of our children. Thank you for continuing to put the health of our children first as we continue to ride out the pandemic. You have managed to keep kids in school and support them to thrive in an uncertain time. Between mask precautions, pool testing, contact tracing, and now organizing vaccine clinics for some of our youngest students, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude for the work being done at so many levels to make all of these things happen. I think Tina mentioned over 300 students being tested, and I just think that's amazing. Um, thank you also for prioritizing work around equity and inclusion in our schools. I don't understand all the pieces in the detail that maybe Sean shared um, and who's doing what and by who, but what I do know is that there's a task force that's working in collaboration um, with a consultant. And I think that's a really important approach to addressing some of um, the challenges that we face around improving in areas of equity and inclusion. Um, and even though I don't totally understand curriculum, I understand that teachers are working hard to incorporate culturally responsive practices within the classroom to ensure that all students get the instruction that they deserve. And as a parent, I'm also looking forward to learning more at the culturally um, responsive education information and dialogue series that is being held through the library. So thank you to the school for organizing that for parents to be more informed. Um, in 2036 and 2038, my kids will be the first graduating classes of FRSU to have a pre-K to grade 12 education experience that addresses areas of equity and inclusion. My hope is that both of them will leave Frontier with a complete understanding of our world in order to hopefully make it a better place than it is now. I thank you all for helping to support their development in a way that prepares them to do this. And let's hope that this is the last pandemic for a long time. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Annie. <clears throat> um, Jennifer Smith. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't print my statement, so I'm gonna read it off the computer, which never goes as well as holding paper for me, so. Do my best, but thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I wanted to um, speak so I could let you know about this fantastic event coming up that a few people have um, spoken about. It is an event that is bringing our community together around the education of our young people and creating a greater understanding of each other. Frontier Regional School District 
the town libraries and the Deerfield Inclusion Group worked together this summer to plan a community education series called the Community Dialogue, coming together around culturally responsive education. The series will begin on November 18th and will continue on February 17th, March 24th, and April 28th. We work together with Sapphire Dijon and Tong Chang from the Collaborative for Education, who will be facilitating the workshops. The four workshops are titled, Listening Comes First, Exploring what's, What is at the Heart of the Matter for Each of Us, Culturally Responsive Education, Hopes and Concerns, Digging Deeper with Connected Conversations, and finally, Where Do We Go From Here? We encourage people to sign up for as many of the four workshops as possible. The idea of these workshops is to make a space for people to come from across the district together to learn how to have dialogues about our common values and to understand how culturally and historically responsive teaching can embrace all learners and teach from multiple perspectives. We are so thankful that there are such an active community members, such a large number of active community members who care so much about what their students are learning and want to understand what is happening in the classrooms. When we come together in conversation and stay open to learning about our shared values and our common goals for our students, we can choose to be a stronger community for our children and for each other. So I hope people can go to the Tilton Library's website where they can register for the Community Dialogue Series. Again, it begins November 18th, and each workshop starts at 6.30 p.m. I'm happy to answer any further questions. I'm always available through my school email. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you to all three of you for uh, your comments and, and um, messages this evening. So <clears throat> um, I think that concludes the public comment, according to my notes. And we will be moving on to unfinished business would be the COVID-19 update. <clears throat> hey, Kim, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, to put up the, uh, can people see that? Just so people, what Jen was talking about, just in case they wanted to write down any of those dates that may have come out there while I'm talking about. Can you guys all see that fine? It's, it's a weird sideways. diagonal again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me try again. I'll do it twice. I don't know why it does this to me sometimes. But... It looks like something I would do, Darius. <clears throat> no. No. Nope. Do the same thing. Nope, same thing. Well, look at it diagonally. You can see. <laughs> uh, all right. That's so bizarre. <laughs> I can do it one more time just because I am persistent, and then I'm not going to waste any more time. Three for three. <clears throat> no. 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 Problem. All right. All right. Um, you know, I'll try to put it up a little bit later if I can, because um, I'm going to have to leave because uh, and come back on because um, when we talk about the uh, capital, you really need to see those lines. Um, so basically, we're just kind of going over the COVID update. Um, you know, it was in my I'm just going off my superintendent um, report. To the school committee, so um, you guys can look at that later. But um, right now, we were, as you know, there has been a approved vaccine for um, five to um, eleven year olds, and we got right out of the gate and set up two. Um, it's called the bus vax, you know, the vax bus coming to town. But we had so many people sign up that it's actually going to be inside the schools. And so, you know, thank you to Tina um, for hosting um, the Deerfield Clinic, and Sunderland's hosting another clinic, and those are going to be on the. Um, 17th and 19th, and um, we you know, we pushed out the signups for that. Right now, there's over 300 people signed up for the Deerfield Clinic, and over 200 people signed up for the Sunderland Clinic. So um, that's just great, and um, we're happy we we're able to do that. And as you probably saw, we opened it up, and then we had to close it because so many people signed up. And I really want to give it, you know, hats off to. Meg and the other organizers in the town that really got pushed back and to get more slots available um, in opening that back up. So it's great that I think we're going to be a leader in the area that's going to be able to do mass clinics like this, um, which is great. So 
is Deerfield on the 17th and Sunderland on the 19th, or are both of them on the 17th and 19th? No, Deerfield, thank you. Deerfield's on the 17th and Sunderland's on the 19th. Okay. So, um, and, uh, you know, for those in other districts that are watching this school committee meeting, um, you know, you're certainly welcome to sign up on those. We picked the two biggest towns, obviously, to host the, the clinics. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, my, I would like to just express appreciation to Meg, as always, for, and you for jumping on, on and finding the resources to uh, put together these clinics. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, the other thing is that is, since our last full meeting, Jesse has come out and extended the mask mandate until January. Um, and at that time, they're going to give us guidance or prior to that time, um, they're going to give us guidance on basically what the commissioner is calling an offering. And so we'll see. Um, we're going to be in a holding pattern until January. Um, I did have some questions that people are, am I going to create plans for an offering up ahead of time? Um, I really, have, I think I'm waiting to see, you know, um, I think planning, it's not going to take long-term planning to do that. I think it's going to be pretty, you know, um, either scripted from the state or guidance scripted from the state that we're going to be able to work off of. But you can expect as a governing body that in January, we're going to have discussions about what an off-ramp plan looks like and what the timing of that's going to be. Um, and so it may be pushed off again several months, you know, depending on numbers and where the state feels or the state's going to recommend that we start that, you know, certain percentages are vaccinated and that we um, look at changing COVID protocols. So I'm just letting people know because people are, some people are asking and certainly in the public about, you know, when is this going to come to an end and that kind of thing. And then there's also going to be a lot of anxiety about um, changing um, any of our practices. And so we got to be cognizant of both things. So um, that's where we are with the, COVID update. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda would be public comment guidelines, which will uh, conclude in a vote on the um, public comment policy that you had sent to you earlier this this month. So did you want to, uh, Darius? You're muted <clears throat> or silenced. I uh, purposely did hard. because I wanted to um, see if I can share my screen without being diagonal because sometimes. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> so we're not that time. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, all right. So you all received the. Um, um, the policy, if you want policy, the policy on regarding public comment, um, the chairs did get together and put together um, what they did is they reordered the priority comments to one, two, and of one, two, and three, and also let it get at the discretion of the chair whether or not the policy needed to be read at the beginning of every public comment. Um, and but if the policy is read, that the first three are stressed. Um, in those first three, being speakers will be allowed three minutes to present their material. The preside, presiding chairperson may ex, permit an extension of this time limit. Improper comments or remarks are not allowed. Deflammatory abusive remarks are always out of order. If the speaker persists in, in improper conduct or remarks, the chairman, chairperson may terminate that individual's privilege of address. And any committee member may direct questions to the speaker through the chair in order to clarify the comments of the speaker. A committee member is encouraged to call a point of order should the member believe the public comment rules are not being followed. So those are the, kind of the top three that we emphasize are the, are the main ones. Um, and then there's more if it's going to be, um, you know, we feel going to be a, a very well attended or passionate evening of public comment where we may want to have the complete ground rules. And so at the end of, we added also that, you know, the discretion isn't within the chair to make that decision at the beginning of public comment. And that we will also send out these public comments, um, guidance to people who want to do public comment. <clears throat> it'll be on our website yes so and i and i would point out that um darius did bring together the chairs to discuss these changes and his and the suggested language that you have in front of you and this is the result of that uh group meeting <laughs> so <clears throat> do i have any questions from the committee regarding the 
<clears throat> the proposed policy. Um, I, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve policy BEDH dash E. <laughs> I move to approve the policy BEDH dash E. Second. And David second. Um, any yeah. further? Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. And it would be Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. <clears throat> David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. And then it's unanimous. <clears throat> um, before we leave this topic, I did want to um, say that, Erica, you had sent me a, an email this week. I didn't have a chance to respond to it. I apologize. Um, Erica asked um, specifically a, a question regarding the ability to either request things on the agenda or react to public comment if we've had a number of meetings where public comment is focusing on a specific topic or seems to be on a specific topic, if there's a way to get that onto an agenda. And I would just say to all the committee members in terms of uh, agenda items, it's not a closed door or a, a backdoor policy. If you have something that you'd like to see addressed on in future agendas, then by all means, either let Darius or myself know and we can get them on the agenda for discussion in the future. Um, and if, you know, if in the course of public comment, the a committee member feels that it might be something that's worth discussing in the future, you could certainly raise the issue through the chairperson and we can see if the committee agrees uh, it, that it should, you know, would be good to have it on. So I appreciate your asking the question, but... Uh, agenda topics are not the purview of just the uh, superintendent or the administration or the chairman. Um, all committee members are certainly welcome and also the general public. If they have something they think might be a worthwhile topic, they can also suggest it. So I uh, hope I haven't overstepped my bounds, Darius, but uh, that's always been my always been my policy and take on agenda items. So. Thank you for asking, Erica. So. Sure. Well, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, new, new business, school improvement presentation. <clears throat> I think that's school improvement plan, but if yeah, you want school a presentation. <laughs> School improvement <laughs> plan presentation. I wasn't sure what that. you were looking for there. Um, <laughs> So I sent it to you. Do I dare try to pull it up and present it? Um, let me give you a, a little bit of a, a history about how it came about. Um, so the school council met and we reviewed some surveys from last year along with other data and the surveys were from teachers and families and students. And we adjusted some of our um, goals and our action steps um, accordingly. And then this was passed through the, the school faculty. Um, we also are, we align with our district strategic plan and we, our goal areas are curriculum instruction, inclusive practices, communication, community relations, and school culture. So they're the same um, goal topics or goal areas as of last year. Would you like me to try to present it? <laughs> oh, I see Jerry has taken his head. Yeah. So let, let me give it a whirl here. Give a lot of work there. Show it off. <laughs> Let's see if mine goes sideways. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. You just disappeared altogether. <laughs> I know. I thought that would be a better idea. Let's see. Is it going? It's not working. Hold on one second. trying to do it by a tab because I think that's going to be the best bet. Let's hope it doesn't go crooked. What do you got? There you go. All right. You're there. All right. So, I mean, I can walk you through it a little bit. It's so weird because I can't see you guys, but um, 
Under the onboarding program, this is new for us this year. Our ILT um, is now providing coaching for our new teachers. And so that's a helpful onboarding support system for our, our new teachers that are coming on board. It's really quite a lot. I'm not, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but I'll keep going down through the line here. Um, you know, our trauma-informed care, we are seeing a lot of students because of the pandemic and other reasons that are coming in with some um, lagging skills. And so we're, we're looking at how we can support that through data. You know, communication, I think some of you have seen our new Parent Square communication. So it's another um, system that we're implementing that is providing um, an easier, I guess, and more efficient way for a two-way communication between families and the schools. And it actually offers a little bit of a personal flair because we can add pictures. Um, and so I think families seem to be enjoying that. Just a small typo in there. It's parent sway. <laughs> All right, so I should go back in and fix that. No, I won't no, do it online and bore no, you. No, but, no, no, no. <laughs> All right, let me switch back over so I can see you. All right. So it's um, a pretty thorough plan and I'm happy to take any feedback or um, thoughts. Well, in, in my reading of it, I was uh, pleased to see the um, changes made to you know recognize the the problems that 2020 21 created for the school and the fact that uh, those have been integrated into the improvement plan are, are very encouraging it's it's nice to see that effort being made um, the parent squares certainly it's been fun to to be in the uh, in the loop a little bit more as school committee members now and uh, I appreciate that <clears throat> so I I thought it was a very well done plan and I appreciate the efforts of all involved with putting it together. Thank you. So I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, I, I was glad to read through the plan. Uh, it seems like it's maybe more detailed than in the past, which I was happy to see a lot of like specific things, uh, which was mm -hmm. great. Um, and I, I love the areas you're focusing on. And thank you to everyone who's involved. I know it's been a big project and a tough year, et cetera. So great job, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I could entertain a motion to <clears throat> approve the school improvement, Deerfield Elementary School School Improvement Plan uh, for 2021-22 as presented. So moved. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, we will go to a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Gary Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Which brings us now to capital improvement plan. So I think that the visually to go through is the easiest way. And Shelly, do you think you could share your screen since I'm... Yep, no problem. Let's see if Shelly's any better. I'm sure she's in these, she's in these, sheets, all, these, these sheets all day long of... Um, Excel or whatnot, so she will be just fine. Um, Is that working? Yep. Okay. You know, can you scroll up just a hair? Oh, no, you're fine. It's the. So, what we do is um, we create a, for those who haven't seen this sheet before, um, this is a, is a uh, planning sheet that we put together that basically the very top of the sheet, actually, if you scroll up a little bit, um, 
It shows what we've done in the past few years because people are always going to be asking, usually when it comes to capital, didn't we just fund that or weren't we doing something like this? And they can see um, within this, we'd be trying to be very transparent about what the job is, where are we with the priority, the costs, any notes, um, you know, what FY year was in, you know, what was approved and what was actually spent, um, that kind of thing. And so the gray is where we've completed in recent years. Um, and then in the blue is what we've completed are we either in progress or just has completed in the last year. Um, and then the green is what we're looking for um, this year. And that's where we'll kind of focus in. Um, one of the things, you know, you know, we want to start talking about is bringing AC into the elementary school. Um, and not only because we're seeing a, a climate shift um, and seeing more hot days when schools are open, um, but it's also about the health the health of a building. And so when you have those high humidity winters, I mean, summers rather, um, we're starting to have a high humidity winter probably too. Um, and you don't have good air circulation and without air conditioning and that kind of stuff, you know, you're going to run the risk of having mold issues and that kind of thing, a la what happened in one of our neighboring districts where they had their building shut down. Um, and so we're looking to, um, over time, um, put AC doing similar how we did the carpet in the rooms by asking to do you know, a certain amount of money each year over multiple years. Right now, there is, um, we are told that Eversource may be having some grant opportunities that will be coming out in January. So this is kind of, a, if you're looking at that, it's, you know, we're looking at $45,000 to do six rooms. However, that number could come down significantly because um, what we're hearing out of rumors out of Eversource, and I hope those rumors turn to be true, that there's going to be some, um, some funding, you know, grant funding where they, similar to how we could replace lights in our schools for, um, for savings and that kind of thing. So um, we probably are going to have to discuss with the town um, the hold on that number because of that grant funding or approach it in a different way um, and, um, you know, using either school choice funds or something like that instead. Mm -hmm. um, our, rest, our restroom upgrades right now, um, you know, we've been doing one set of restrooms each year for the last few years, and now we're on to the three, four wing. And then um, the year after that is the pre-K and K wing um, moving forward. So that's $15,000 a year. Um, the other project that we've been doing over the last few years is doing three rooms at a time, changing the flooring upgrades from carpet to vinyl tiling, then using area carpets for the students when they're on the floor um, for those activities in that um, as you can see, that's continued. And then Shelly talked a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that our kitchen, um, our t kitchen, uh, uh, the dishwasher and the, the ovens and the range and that kind of stuff are due to be, um, are due to be updated as well. And so that we're going to be looking to how do we fix those things. Um, Shelly, do you want to talk about all, a little bit about anything that I may have missed in the sense of thoughts and how we should address this or look at this or no? <laughs> I mean, I think you did a good job explaining it. I, th I think if you're looking at this and looking at the green and priorities, which doesn't address the kitchen things that I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of money that we're talking about for next year as priority. So, you know, how do we break that down so that the needs of the school are balanced between all of these things because the restrooms, the flooring, the AC, the kitchen, they're all really important things. So how do we strike that balance? Do we start talking about using some of our school choice funds um, to try to tackle this list a little bit because we can't expect the town to cover $100,000 in capital. We can certainly ask for it, but you know it can't be an expectation that they do cover it, but we also don't want to defer projects like this for very long. So how do we um, space that out so that everything is getting taken care of? Okay. That's true. <clears throat> um, and we certainly know the town's got uh, some major capital needs coming up. So it's going to be a, another interesting year on the capital front. But having this list will certainly help in the, in the discussions. So. So Ken, are you looking at, you know, you know, you got one foot in that meeting already for tomorrow night, you know, that we talk about our list with that group, get the feeling where the town is at, then we kind of bring this back to have a discussion again at this committee. Is, is that kind of where you feel the, the path is moving forward? That's, 
And that's yes, that's uh, I just wanted to give them a preliminary heads up that we've got some needs and we're probably going to need to act quickly uh, during this particular fiscal year to address some of those needs. So um, it, no matter what we do, technically it has to go through the capital planning committee. So that's why I was saying I <clears throat> wanted the information and we can uh, get the information out there to people and get a sense of their their feelings on it. So that's all. Yep. I, you know, that's all I was looking for. Is there any questions um, about this list, um, school committee members, or um, in, in Shelley, if you want to scroll down a little bit, there's some, you know, just so people have an idea of what else is. Um, I guess I would just have sort of a general comment. I guess it's kind of an obvious comment, but it does seem like all of a sudden the entire kitchen operation is needing to be replaced, which seems a little odd. I think we've been putting Band-Aids on equipment for a long time. And I, I think with a new food service director, there's a new set of eyes and a new lens in there seeing things. Um, in a different way. And I think especially right now with the volume of food that we are serving through the kitchen um, and the way that things had to change between last year and then this year with food service still making modifications, um, I think it's really shining right now uh, the deficiencies and the, the way that the kitchen is running currently it's impacting the productivity of the staff and the food quality. And, um, you know, I'm, we're trying to be supportive of making changes in there and things could certainly be spaced out. Um, but some of this stuff, you know, it, it really can't wait. We can't have an oven that isn't properly cooking food. You know, the amount of time that it's taking the staff to produce food with ovens that are not working properly is just causing a huge back up. You know, you can't go and set a 20 minute timer like you would to bake a tray of cookies. You've got to constantly be checking, pulling out, rotating. And I mean, they're making it work, but it, it's just, it's not ideal and it's impacting food quality. Mm -hmm. And I also have to say, David, we've started addressing this in other schools with similar age kitchens. You know, Wheatley had just had to buy new ovens um, last year as part of their capital improvement. Um, you know, why you know, these things have not, were not like three or fours two years ago. You know, certainly, you know, we have a new direct, you know, director who came in, did inventory about what's working, what's not working, and um, is, was shocked about the amount of things that weren't working. Um, and, the, and also remember, because meals are free, service is up. You know, we're serving a lot more breakfast than ever before, and a lot more, so the kitchens are, you know, their, their time frame for cooking when now that they're serving breakfast for lunch is shortened by a bit in man hours and that kind of stuff. So I guess maybe it's double, two things are happening at once. We got another, another new set of eyes and we're, um, as Shelly just said, we're producing more out of those kitchens. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, can I? Erica? Yeah, I was just yes. gonna sort of comment on those lines that um, the building was, uh, was it a completely new building in 1992 for the- um, Brand new. Brand new. So everything was new then. And just from dealing with things in the museum that I work in, you know, it's like the 15 year, it's like cars, you know, 15 years, they just sort of cycle in and out of, of um, the appliances just have a lifespan as you were telling uh, Shelley. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's almost uh, uh, when you said before that there were four ovens and only one of them's working now, that that that's that uh, you know that's it's good yeah definitely get one of them at least um are they going are you going to uh is this plan I, i'm sorry i'm not seeing the detail are you planning to revamp all four or are you really having to just focus on making one fully 
correctly operational. Um, J- Jeff would love to replace two of them. If we could replace one of them r- right now and have one that's brand new and then use the one that is mostly working, that mm-hmm. would be um, the fastest, easiest solution to get things more operational. But his recommendation is not to buy four new whole units down the road. Mm-hmm. He thinks that it's a waste of space and unnecessary in the kitchen that we have. You know, and I don't know if that's what we started with when the kitchen was mm-hmm. um, first put in there or if we bought things over time, but um, his recommendation would be two moving forward. So on that list, I think I did put um, one as a priority and then a second mm-hmm. oven either as a two or a three down the road. Mm-hmm. Um You know, and Darius is right. We're looking at this across the board. And I think a fresh set of eyes in all of our kitchens is really bringing to light the age of our equipment and the amount of money that we're spending on repairs. And it's repairs that are really only putting band-aids on things. We're not fully repairing Mm -hmm. something back to its original capacity or even close to what the original capacity was. And, you know, it's um, conversations that we're having across the board right now in every school. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like there's a lot of different areas like the AC and the bathrooms and and the kitchen, you know, that everything needs a little bit of or a lot of tweaking. So it's hard to make those. It would be great to, you know, over time just see, just keep us posted on what's the, you know, your top three and, you know, kind of what your priorities are um, so we can make sure that gets done. Mm-hmm. So thanks. Yes. Thank you, Shelly and Darius. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, I think we're down to, we're down to reports, but did we want to go to executive session, Darius, or did you have reports um, beyond, so, we had the principal's report, the chair doesn't have one. Um, the collaborative. Um, so, superintendent, yes, go ahead, Darius. Sorry, that's fine. Um, so, just wanting the uh, odds and ends that are on my report. Um, I did want to say that we did have our kickoff meeting for our anti racism equity committee, and we did hire the um, Romney Associates Consulting Group. Um, we had a great first meeting, and um, we're looking again for um, where we met as a general group and then we broke off into our working groups of those subcommittees and we're looking to follow that same format in December. Um, so we're very um, excited about that. And then um, Jen Smith did come on to talk a little bit about the um, the cultural response of education um, mm-hmm. in the community. So that was there too. Um, negotiations have um, started as well. We had our original, our, our kickoff meetings with with the associations and set up meeting dates that, you know, so over the next few months, we'll be doing that. And then I attended the Massachusetts um, Mass and MASC conference, and I was there with a couple of our committee members here tonight. Um, but everyone who attended was Jessica Corwin, Carrie Echoes, Bob Hala, and Erica Jacob. Um, and there was a lot of great workshops, you know, stressing from, you know, equity work, budgets, you know, the civility and public meetings, they're seeing issues across the state. Um, and then, of course, COVID was also, and what to do about COVID, and that kind of thing was also a major topic. So um, I do recommend anybody who has not been to that conference to think about it next year as well, because it's um, great to get perspectives of what other school districts are dealing with. Sometimes it's like, whew, like we're not in that district. Um, and then other times it's like, oh, how did you how did you approach that problem and that challenge? And um, gosh, we're, we're going to steal that idea. Um, so it was just really good. So I just want to say that's that's what I got. And if, and if you know, if, if Eric or Carrie want to talk a little bit about that, they can too. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> so, um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead, Erica. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say that I, I also, you know, sort of as a new person on school committees in general, and then also it was really, I felt it really was kind of inspiring to. Uh, I think that, yeah, there was a bit of it where it's like, oh, okay, so these are actually a lot of the same, you know, we're not the only ones who are dealing with some of the issues that we're facing. And so actually I've been getting in touch with some of the other, uh, some of the school committee members in other places to sort of, you know, um, compare notes and things. So um, I thought that was really 
helpful. And, um, you know, it, it, there, yeah, it was really, it was really kind of inspiring to be able to see also just in general, the intense, uh, the intent of all of the people on the school committees to do, to put the kids first and to be there to, you know, the, everyone there was all about getting our schools to be the best they can be and, and figure out ways to do it. So it's just, you know, and a real raw, raw moment kind of about, about being on the school committee and feeling that it's, you know, reminding me of, you know, sort of the reasons why I don't joined it and, and what we can, you know, what we can accomplish. So um, mm-hmm. hoping to take, bring us, bring some of that, that juice back home kind of thing. Um, I just also realized that whenever it's appropriate, I, I do have a, a brief statement to make about the seat, uh, the, the collaborative. I, I missed my opportunity back. Oh, no, you didn't. If, if you want to give a collaborative statement, that's fine. We can oh, okay. do that now under reports. Okay. <clears throat> it, it was just that I did receive the, um, uh, ex- the executive director did give a report and, um, you know, apologies for the late notice, but I have now sent it to all of you. So um, you can see all of the things that, that um, have been occurring with the new uh, changeover and new uh, new executive director is on board now. And um, so I went to, it was the one first meeting that we had so far. We've only met once on September 29th. So okay. um, there's some other stuff in the pipeline, but, but that at least covers, it sums it all up. So I okay. want to make sure to put that in there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, okay, so we are now down to we have um, we have two executive session um, notations here. Are we going to discuss both items, Darius, or you just uh, had a preliminary meeting on the negotiations, right? So right, there's nothing really to report on negotiations. So we are looking at, um, but you, it'll be on there for moving forward. Um, once we're right. in negotiations, I'll always leave it on there in case you yep. want to go to executive session and discuss how things are going. Okay. Um, but we do need to go in for number 10 there um, to discuss so, strategy right. with respect to litigation. Uh, so we'll go in and not come back. So Correct. Um, I, I would make that notation. Um, I will t- entertain a motion to enter executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation. We would be entering executive uh, session, uh, conducting no business and not returning to general session. So this would be the adjournment of the general session of our meeting at 6.20, whatever p.m. once we vote. So do I have a, a motion? I make that motion. Uh, Carrie. And a second. Second. And Mary second. <clears throat> Roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Um, <clears throat> Carrie Etchells? Yes. Um, David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. Okay. If you could invite, so, in, if you could invite in Principal Jim. Right. You would have an invitation on uh, email, so we'll be signing out of this and signing back into the executive session. Thank you to all the um, folks out there who uh, were joined us this evening. And uh, thank you, Shelly, Tina, and the rest. Uh, Have a great night, everyone.